I'm Af Malhotra and this is Straight Talk. It's 2022, a new year, a new pathway, a new journey. I'm absolutely thrilled to start off this season three uh, episode with you with a great, great individual and a person who I will introduce momentarily. Before I do so, let me tell you about our plan and our agenda this year. There are three big transformations we're going to be focusing on. First one is the digital world order. This is where we look at the good and the bad side of digital. We cover all aspects of technology. We're going to bring in experts to discuss everything from the metaverse to NFTs, blockchain, and even cryptocurrency. The second area is climate realism. This is where we will be super realistic about decarbonization. We will cut through the noise and the hype that you see in the media and get right into showcasing some of the coolest innovations and innovators in the green space and sustainability space, as well as challenging some of the ideas and thought process around what we need to do as humanity to make the world a better place. The third area, and the most important to some extent for me, is diversity economics. This is very much about looking at the economic argument of diversity, the numbers, the data. What do we need to do to justify diversity being a central feature, a default part of culture moving forward, not just locally, but also globally. Today, our guest is a gentleman called Dr. Ramesh Mashalkar. He is without question, not only the coolest guy for some of the young folks out there on, on the call, he is super accomplished. He has immense credibility. And I have to say the one thing I've taken away from him, and many things, of course, the one thing I've taken away in a brief discussion with him before this, show is the, the gentleman's humility and as an individual myself I'm learning from that humility and I really respect and admire it. Now before I go to Dr. Michelka I want to say a little bit about him. Now he has a huge CV so I don't think we'll have uh, time to cover all of his accolades. It'll take 60 minutes for me to do so but I will touch on a few things. Uh, Dr. Michelka apart from many accolades, being uh, on the board of Tata and Reliance and advising some of the biggest companies, leaders and government and national leaders, he was a very successful leader himself and was the Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR. <clears throat> He'll refer to that no doubt in his, in his discussion with, with me later today. He's been the president of the Indian National Science Academy, the chairman of National Innovation Foundation, the president of, of the UK Institution of Chemical Engineers, the president of Global Research Alliance. Um, he's also got 44 honorary degrees. It was hard enough for me to get two, let alone 44. So um, he, he is an absolute um, genius when it comes to that. He's pioneered research in polymer science and engineering. Uh, especially in non-Newtonian uh, fluid mechanics and stimulus response, uh, which is which is incredible. I'm sure he'll touch on that. Uh, he is the Fellow of the Royal Society uh, in London. He was also elected Foreign Associate of the U.S. National Academy of Science, National Academy of Engineering, and of course the list goes on and on and on. One of the most important things I do want to say, which I think is going to be important for the folks in the West listening to this, is that uh, Dr. Michelka wrote a very, very important, co-authored a very important paper, uh, a Harvard paper, with the great C.K. Prahlad, which was called The Holy Grail. And that paper was seismic in that it changed the mindset of CEOs globally around looking at innovation in a very different way, i.e. inclusive innovation, innovation that is different to the innovation that we've been taught in the West for, for many, many years. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Michelle Kerr onto the show. Welcome, sir. Great to have you on the show, and uh, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a special honor, a special privilege to be on your program. Thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 it's um, the feelings are mutual. So we're going to get right into it because there's a lot to discuss, and we have limited amounts of time. Um, before I start, I, I you know, I'd like to dig into something that's super important because I, I recall you saying to me there are two things that are bothering you right now or that you care about. The first one is access equality and the second one is the importance of aspirations that then create possibilities. And I'm sure you will unpack that for us uh, during the process uh, of this call. Before we start though, it's very important for all of us to understand who you are. 
who are you really? Where do you come from? And what is what has been instrumental in getting you to where you are today? Um, and if you could give us some color around that, your background, your personal story, that will set the foundation for, I'm sure, everything else you say to us, because the, the connect, the connect, the dots will be joined extremely well uh, in my mind. So over to you. The ball is the cricket ball is on your side, as I say. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, uh, the story starts in a village called Mashel. Uh, it was a poor village in uh, Goa. Uh, I was born there to a very, very poor family. My father died when I was six. My mother was illiterate. And in search of a job, she brought me to Bombay. Now it is called Mumbai. And she did practically manual work to bring me up. Right. Uh, two meals a day was a challenge. I have gone hungry many nights. Uh, I studied under the street lights. I walked barefoot until I was uh, 12. Uh, there were very hard times, uh, as a matter of fact. Uh, I remember the days when I passed to primary school, uh, seven standard to go to eight standard, we require 21 rupees and uh, 21 rupees is one fourth of a dollar right. and, cents. and it took me it, it took my mother three weeks to gather that uh, those were the hard circumstances uh, I did my secondary school certificate exam in the state of Maharashtra and I stood 11th among 135,000 students and uh, but I was still going to leave my education mm -hmm. because my Poor mother was really suffering and I wanted uh, uh, to help her by taking a job. But then miracles do happen and I got uh, Sardo Raptata scholarship, which was 60 rupees per month for six years. Again, less than a dollar a month and that is how I could uh, study. I did my bachelor's degree in chemical engineering and then also the PhD. Uh, came to UK, uh, first as Sir Louis Matheson district professor, then became a lecture in Stanford University and then uh, went on to teach in US and then I came back to the country under very interesting circumstances by the way. Mm -hmm. because, you know when it comes to developing countries, poor countries, you always talk about brain drain. Okay and I was, a, I was going to be part of that brain drain but uh, then something happened. Uh, Mrs. Gandhi was then the Prime Minister. She sent the Director General of CSIR uh, to US and uh, UK and she had found that uh, young scientists are trying to come back and get a gainful employment but they don't get and they go back frustrated. Yeah. Uh, in Khurana, you know, he came, he didn't get a job in ICR, went back and got a Nobel Prize, so as to say. So she said, just go and spot them and give them job on the spot. And I was one of the sort of shortlist women and I remember I just got a telex message from director of National Chemical Laboratory, telex, by the way, at that time, many of you might not even heard what telex <laughs> was, <laughs> saying that we should go and meet uh, Dr. Naiduma, then the director general of CSR. And uh, it is interesting, when I went in, I did not know I'm going to promise him that I'm going to come back. So if there is something about me, mm. I think from here, not from here. All right. Yeah. And instinctively, uh, when he said you can come and uh, this is the India that you can build. I was barely 32 at that time. I threw away everything and I basically came back under very tough circumstances. Became, uh, I mean, I was a scientist in NCL, became the director of National Chemical Laboratory, then the director of CSR, which is a chain of 40 uh, uh, laboratories. So that has been sort of my, I would say, professional background and uh, uh, career. That's what. Uh, and, and can I ask what drove you to come back? Because, of course, you were making a mark for yourself, building your brand in international markets. And given where India was at that point, what it, was it a personal reason, if I may ask, or a professional reason, both? Or was it just, you know, you, as you said, the heart? It was the heart. <clears throat> I was doing very well. In fact, I had a big job offer in US at that time and also one in Imperial College. And uh, I... Uh, uh, just because it was the way Dr. Nayaduma talked to me about India. Right. 
Yeah, and, and, and said that young people like you, if you come and build India, uh, you know, because finally it is uh, the power uh, of mind that actually builds nations, basically. And the best of minds, you can't afford to lose them. They have to come and serve the country, you know, and that appealed to me, basically. You know, it is those, one of those emotional moments when you say yes and you come back. And then um, you come back under very tough circumstances. Uh, it is not the India of today. Right. All right? Yeah. Uh, but our uh, GDP per capita was close to $100, by the way. Today mm -hmm. it is $2,000 GDP per capita. Um, uh, we, today we have a billion mobiles in India, right? It took us six years to get a telephone, by the way. Six years. We were in the queue. Journals used to come by emails. So after three or four months, we'll know what is happening in the rest of the world, all right? And uh, uh, so th there were very difficult conditions. But, you know, as I uh, say, I mean, as we say in our paper, the CK Pralat paper that you talked right. about, right, you know, yeah. which was Holy Grail, uh, which appeared in July, August 2010 issue of Harvard Business Review. Uh, uh, there we say aspirations, scarcity and aspirations is a deadly combination. So right. yeah, okay? yeah. And, and that, that is what it was. And therefore, it was that aspiration, uh, basically keeping our aspirations high, that actually uh, sort of did it all. So therefore, uh, as you know, uh, there have been only two living engineering scientists uh, today in India. In 360 years, we have got the honor of becoming a fellow of Royal Society, London, right? And then you sign in the same book where Newton has signed. That's the greatest honor that one can get. Mm. The kind of research that we did with uh, uh, practically nothing and with just uh, uh, what I might say is not on the power of budget, but power of ideas. Yes. Actually, able to get us uh, that uh, uh, sort of honor. So I, I discovered something that it is not, uh, it is the power and the strength of your ideas that actually sort of finally mattered. And that is how India has been propelled. India has been a poor country, as, yeah. as you uh, quite know. But it has been rich in ideas in terms of several uh, sort of other things. That's what makes it special. So the answer mm -hmm. to your question was that, yes, it was an emotional burst, but that willingness to give back to the country. Mm. What I find fascinating about your journey, of course, I've, I've um, been studying your path for a while now. And I think one of the most in incredible things about the East, and in this case, India, is is this, the, 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 the story of, I don't want to call it rags to riches, that's not what I mean. What I mean is you can, you can, you can be a central part of the scarcity. You can be in an environment where, which, where, where you were, where you talk uh, very emotionally and passionately about your mother. Um, and you've obviously created a foundation that we'll talk about um, in, a, in a second, the Anjani Mashelka Foundation, which is, which is incredible. And, you know, kudos to you for doing so. Um, how one can dream big and have aspirations, even through that scarcity, and then end up in incredible places. I mean, of course, you are, I, I wouldn't call you an outlier. I actually, maybe now more so, there are more and more people like you who have big dreams. And I think, you know, one of the things you shared with me, which, uh, and I come from the startup world too, which was fascinating that India has produced roughly 75 unicorns during this COVID period, which is incredible. Half of those individuals and founders come from tier two, tier three city uh, backgrounds and universities. So not, not necessarily the big Ivy League equivalents in India, like the IIT and IIMs, which is incredible. It's a great indicator of what's to come. So my question to you therefore is, is this what makes the Indian inside or outside of India um, exceptional? Because of course, India and Indians in India operate in an ecosystem and people like you are challenging um, society to progress, to push them to, to the, the limits. And then of course you take the Indian out of India like you were back in, in the day and when you had a big job offer from various places and you decided to go back to India. But even today you see Indians in other parts of the world who are excelling, CEOs of big technology companies, whether it's Satya Nadella or Sundar Pichai and various others. Uh, and of course the Indian in India and the Reliance family, the Tata family that I know you're very close to and have advised personally. So I, I'm going to I'm going to shift gears, go back and forth, if that's okay. 
But given given your background, given what you know about what it means to have scarcity and aspirations and how deadly that combination is, and I think I like the way you are referred to as and you refer yourself to as uh, the dangerous optimist. Um, tell us about that, because I think that along with scarcity, aspirations, is the, is the most powerful formula that creates magic uh, and has allowed the Indian to excel in not just in India, but other parts of the world. Yes, I, I, I agree. In fact, uh, uh, you know, there are two, three things uh, that I want to sort of uh, specifically mention. Uh, you mentioned that I was chairman of National Innovation Foundation. Yes, for 18 years. You know what is that foundation? It deals with grassroots innovation. Artisans, farmers, school dropouts, all right? Uh, ordinary people on the street. And our fundamental belief is that everyone is someone. And minds on the margin are not necessarily marginal minds. Everyone can basically sort of uh, innovate. And it is incredible. If you go to NI website, you'll find some 20,000 such innovations uh, that have been posted because the moment they see a problem, these, uh, uh, let's say, school dropouts or artisans or farmers, they don't uh, uh, actually be a part of the problem. They want to be a part of a solution. Right. And the meeting solutions uh, get uh, actually created. That is something special about uh, India. And of course, then you talk about Jugaad innovation. I don't like the word Jugaad innovation because Jugaad is a lot of compromise in terms of safety, sustainability, or uh, 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 aesthetics, or environmental issues, and so on and so forth. I like to uh, talk about Indian innovation as the one that belongs to affordable excellence because normally affordability and excellence don't go together. Uh, what is affordable is not excellent. What is excellent is not affordable. Uh, but then can you do the 10x magic, 10 times better, 10 times cheaper? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, that is basically uh, uh, the idea. So the central point, and I will come back to my uh, to sort of uh, present passion about access equality despite income inequality uh, 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 very shortly. But the basic challenge for India is the following, and because we talked about brain drain, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, uh, I was uh, interviewing the... Uh, 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 for the post of uh, chief innovation officer, a young man uh, was appearing for the interview for National Innovation Foundation, of which I was the chairman. Yeah. On his CV. And his CV said that uh, he uh, is great in building brands. Oh, I said, that's fantastic. So why didn't you tell me uh, how we can brand India? And uh, uh, I mean, uh, and then he sort of uh, struggled because he had branded a refrigerator, a car, how do you brand a nation? And then I helped him by saying that, look, US brands itself as a land of opportunity. How do you brand India? And you know what was the instant response? Uh, of? He said, yes, India is a land of ideas. Mm -hmm. And here is the bad news. The good news is India is a land of ideas. The bad news is that we are not a land of opportunity. It is the US or the Western world. So how do you make India into a land of opportunity? You get the point. And that is where I, I'm very proud uh, uh, that you right in the, at the outset mentioned, and I'm going to come to that a little later, that today we are talking about 75 unicorns. Mm -hmm. We have just emerged during the last couple of years uh, in India. And 50% of them, as you say, came from tier two, tier three. You see why? Uh, there are some dropouts, as a matter of fact. Mm. Can you imagine, therefore, a uh, young, uh, uh, late 20 uh, boy who comes, uh, let's say, from a village having a market cap of a billion dollars? Right. Yeah, it's astounding. Yeah. That, that is the part of the opportunity part. Because the Startup India program that the uh, Indian government created, it was not that startups were not new. I mean, you heard about Kiran Muzunar Shah, Biocon, or uh, so on and so forth, you know. But it has not accelerated in the way that uh, uh, so, sort of uh, it has. So suddenly it is becoming that land of opportunity. And actually, I would say that brain drain is giving rise to brain gain and brain circulation. Young yeah. people are coming back. <clears throat> yeah. For example, uh, if you see, one of the great things about India is uh, the uh, fact 
that the intellectual capital per dollar that is generated is the highest in the world. Uh, uh, you know, in terms of uh, you take any matrix, for example, look at papers, patterns, these, etc. Per dollar spent, if you see uh, what is the number, uh, you know, in absolute terms, we might come low. But mm -hmm. when it comes to that intellectual capital per dollar, we come high. And that is why India has become a global research and design and development platform. Today, as we speak up, there are 1,160 companies, top companies, who's who, who have set up their R&D centers in India. And Indian IP is generating IP there. Some of them uh, are even uh, sort of uh, uh, one third of their global patterns come from, 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 from India. And more than wow. 360,000 scientists, engineers, technology are working. But almost one third of them have come back from abroad. India is a land of opportunity as far as mm. the scientific research is concerned. India is a land of opportunity as far as the startups are concerned, and so on and so forth. I, mean, I can sort of uh, elaborate on that. So when you yes. ask me what is special about India, it is this. Uh, affordable yeah. economies and highest intellectual capital per dollar that gets generated. Yeah. Yeah, let's go back to that. I want to I want to pull a thread there. Let's go back to this demographic, which is very, very important, because I think um, I often refer to India as the new India. And wh what I mean, and new India means different things to different people. But the new India for me as an entrepreneur, as a technology investor and founder is the new generation of innovators and innovations and startups. And many of the startups will succeed, some won't, some will pivot, and, and so on and so forth. But I love the fact that you have this younger generation who have the courage, the will, the desire, the grit to go off and break the rules and innovate like anyone else in the world. And I think it's remarkable. Now, I, I want to ask you some questions about this, because when you talked about the innovation centers being built in India for the large corporations and that large number you shared, and of course, a third of these people coming back, Tell us a little bit about what you're seeing on the ground. Um, let me throw my hypothesis at you and then you can break it down and challenge it and say yes or, or no. I believe that the new generation of, of entrepreneurs in India, young, younger people, need to be engaged with from the West, engaged with, um, uh, you know, need to be supported, need to be um, respected, need to be... Um, sort of um, cultivated by the West in a very different way to how the West did it 15 years ago when we used to talk about in the UK the diaspora that came over here we used to talk about the history with India I would argue that the young generation I've spoken to have grown up on books by Shashi Tharoor uh, like the Inglorious Empire in fact they are almost a little bit anti the West to some extent because they want to recreate a new history for India, albeit 85 years old in terms of at least the democracy that we've been enjoying. What is your view on this new India? Is what I'm saying making sense or is there something that we're missing? Because I want to get this across. I'd like to get this message across to the, the audiences that listen from you uh, so you can, you can educate us on this. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think that's an excellent question. <coughs> uh, you know, uh, 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 my narrative is always through some uh, experiences that I've gone through in my life. I always speak from the book of my life, not those books that you see behind me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, And they're always more valuable to me. So I'll tell you my own experience with uh, young people. Uh, for, for example, I was uh, uh, having a conversation with uh, uh, some uh, group of young people. And then I'm very proud of the Indian education system, which has given so many leaders across mm -hmm. the world, as you know, uh, Silicon Valley success, of course, is attributed to many things, but also the Indian entrepreneurs who have done so well there and so on and so forth. So I was talking about, uh, uh, you know, Satya Nadeva, for example, being the CEO of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. uh, so Sundar Pichai is uh, the CEO of uh, Google, all right? And uh, you can aspire to become uh, Sundar Pichai or uh, Satya Nadeva. One young fellow, I've got up and uh, uh, politely he called me, sir. Of course, we are very polite, as you know. We always call seniors. <laughs> yes. sir. But at the same time, he said, I disagree with you. I said, I thought I said something nice. He said, no, sir. In your generation, your only aspiration was to go to US somehow. The next generation go to US and get a great job in a great company like Microsoft. Right. The following generation not only go to US, get a job in Microsoft, 
but also become satya and adela ceo not in our case we want to build our own microsoft our own google here in our india that wow. is the question that is the trust that they uh, sort of basically have so i love the confidence of these uh, young people what mm. we need to do very frankly let me tell you the downside also i'm mm. honestly because we should not all be singing praises of india we must also talk about their its weakness yeah then what is called as talent technology and trust we are talking about top talent in fact i remember atul bihari bajpayee ji uh, our former prime minister who started the it revolution always used to say india's future is in it it as in information technology i also used to say yes india's future is in it but not as in information technology in indian talent that gives right. us an actually the uh, superior uh, advantage so we are talking about talent then access to technology suddenly in the new digital world as you know basically the opportunities have just uh, sort of uh, opened up uh, you look at storage and then there is of course cloud you look at software and suddenly there is open source uh, software and you look at uh, uh, data and uh, then uh, mukesh ambani's jio provides it at 4 rupees per gb as you know yeah yeah uh, in the world so that that word has uh, changed completely and there are sort of opportunities what is very important is the trust part of it yeah you make the point that means we must have uh, trust in uh, sort of uh, the innovation that we do i later on come to engineer marshal kar in kuzi innovation award but one of the awardees was uh, uh, a gentleman called dr navin khanna and dengue test as you know is uh, actually well, it takes one or two days and he created something which could be done in 15 minutes and also the stage at which the dengue is all right mm-hmm. but we are importing from south korea from us from australia and suddenly there was a pandemic and uh, when the pandemic broke away there were no kids and nobody was taking navin khanna's kids by the way although it was superior it had reverse patent it had fda approval and so on and so forth there is no simple way. and then what happened was that uh, we approached these countries basically and two of them said no we can't only south korea said we can within the stipulated time and they shipped those diagnostic kits on a wrong ship which went to africa so india had no kits at all oh gosh they had no option but to go to navin khanna he get the point mm-hmm. and now his market share was 0% at that time today it is 75% wow had that yeah. it come to india basically you would have been still at 0% mm-hmm. so i think what i would say that despite all the praises we can sing about our talent and technology i think it is trust it is risk financing it is not just venture capital it's adventure capital mm-hmm. uh, something that is still missing in india and mm-hmm. that i think we need to build and if we build that uh, you know then we'll realize the true potential mm. you've hit the nail on the head i mean i think um tr- trust is actually is is a central very important word when you look at an economy like india 1.3 billion people to be fair though dr michel card there are only two economies in the world countries in the world with so many people uh, one is us or one is india in this case for you and then it's uh, china and uh, they have a very different system their operating system is different end to end and so india is toying around with democracy and to be fair with you know in the uk where 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 i live where we've got 66 million people and that's enough people frankly <laughs> that's just enough people to deal with on an island and we can just about manage and then and if i think about you know the us at 400 plus million people and then india at 1.3 billion people and the complexity of india the the vastness of the land languages cultures i mean the north and the south frankly aren't really always best of friends and don't have that much synergy there is one india but they're different they're very very different so managing all of this and still innovating and still uh, having great talent and technology is remarkable trust is going to be a challenge i believe i mean almost you almost have to uh, what's the word for it you almost have to uh, cut cut india some slack because i think maybe the expectations are unrealistic yeah i i me me since you mentioned about china and as you know the recent challenge with china and the yeah. world uh, can't go china less but 
they are trying to be less China, as as you can see. <laughs> so we we, yeah. we 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 leave that aside because yeah. uh, we are so much dependent upon them and so on. So forth. that's a different subject altogether. In fact, is, yeah. I have a book on that which I have co-authored with some authors with regard to the challenge of China and how do we deal it with strategic patience and so on. But that's a separate matter. But you know, I've, what used to happen as I'm. <laughs> Probably a traveling salesman for India, you know, all over the world, and there are questions. And one of the questions which will always come, by the way, and I think this question was asked to me in MIT, if I remember correctly, when I spoke about Indian innovation, and this was about India and China. Right. It was about 10, 10, 10 12 years ago, and I remember because then I actually formulated the answer so, so that each time I don't say. So I used to say. India's advantage over China is three Ds. First is what you said, democracy. Democracy is allows you to think free, act free, so as to say. And that is a great trigger for innovation, fundamentally. Right. Diversity, huge diversity. And diversity creates, again, uh, sort of uh, uh, a great uh, sort of platform for... And finally, demography. Demography, yeah, you know, in terms of young people, Correct. because uh, the uh, interesting thing about young people is that they don't know that it can't be done. Number one, and number two, they see what each one of us sees, but think of what uh, no one thinks. Basically. Correct. Correct. Yes. So these three Ds, and on the lighter side, I used to also say, I must say, I wish we had the four D discipline. And then, <laughs> That, that's that's the brackets and brackets you should put discipline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, 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 because a lot of people call us, you know, like Amartya Sen has an argument to Indian and chaotic democracy and the rest of it. But that's on the lighter side. I think yeah. well, I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we are the largest democracy uh, in the world and we have seen in, in, in the democracy in its sort of uh, finest forms. So anyway, this was triggered by your remark on China. Yeah, absolutely. So we've covered, and this is fantastic, we've covered such good ground here, your background, uh, the challenging background, you know, how you managed to um, propel yourself with scarcity, aspiration and drive and, and, and um, persevered forward. And you then became the director general of this incredible organization. Now, just give us a quick flavor because there's there's one particular aspect of what you shared which I found remarkable when you talked about you being the first person and how this uh, CSR organization was disjoint and you came in and this is about leadership in a environment in an environment that uh, wouldn't wouldn't have experienced that form of cohesive leadership that level of harmonization so talk us through that particular story I love that when you came in and people were I think there were 40 labs or something they were all over the place yeah, talk us about talk us through that, please. Absolutely. Actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's a great organization. Uh, I was the director of National Chemical Laboratory, but similarly, mm -hmm. there is a National Physical Laboratory, National Aeronautical Laboratory. There is no discipline that is left out. In a sense, it's an right. extremely comprehensive organization. Excepting the challenge was that each laboratory behaved uh, as though it was on its uh, uh, sort of own, so as to say. Mm -hmm. The, that team CSR spirit, uh, one CSR spirit was not there. And this actually uh, is something that I took uh, sort of uh, uh, head on. And I must say that uh, this transformation of CSR, if you look at uh, the book Scientific Age by Jain Nardika, the uh, great astrophysicist, uh, his book talks about the top 10 achievements of uh, uh, Indian science and technology in the 20th century, starting with Ramanujan, you know, the mathematician, or uh, uh, S.N. Bose, stellar astrophysics, then uh, uh, C.V. Raman, who won the Nobel Prize, etc., Green Revolution, and so on. He lists 10 things, you know, and the 10th is CSR transformation. Because the way the alignment basically took place when no two labs wouldn't talk to each other, by the time I had left, it was uh, 19 labs working together. And I still remember 11 May 1998, which is celebrated as a technology day uh, in India. We had all our directors meeting, 40 directors meeting. And, uh, uh, you know, it is incredible. At the end of the day, uh, they signed something. Uh, they said uh, Team India, One India, uh, CSR, 
sorry, India uh, matters to us. We want to matter to India more. You know, that was the kind of uh, transformation. Now, how did that happen? And that is where I think uh, when organization changes uh, are concerned, the very first thing is alignment. Mm-hmm. It is almost like, you know, magnetic needles, w- w- which are on paper, they are all scattered in different directions. And then you bring a magnet, all right? And then they all get aligned, you know, the North-South Pole, as you know, uh, and, and so on. And that magnet is a big purpose, basically. Uh, uh, you know, so organizations need to sort of uh, have that. And there are uh, actually now case studies that have been written on this uh, CSR uh, transformation on how it... Uh, uh, actually um, uh, happened in terms of it was not just about incentivization it was changing the culture right and changing the culture sometimes uh, is very difficult because it is like uh, turning the ship which is not like a turning a scooter correct uh, yeah absolutely yeah and it is a <clears throat> fascinating study and i'm very sort of proud of what we were able to sort of achieve yeah that's it i mean that's incredible i mean i think um you know leadership is is central to i think what you're describing whether it's a national leadership it's enterprise leadership public sector leadership yes and uh, may i if i just uh, sort of talk about that please uh, i have my own way of uh, defining this leadership okay and that came to me uh, from my experience uh, that i had in school as i told you my mother took uh, three weeks to get, uh, get uh, 21 rupees and therefore, all the admissions in top schools were closed, basically. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I went to a poor school where the poorest of the poor children from uh, poor society would come, basically. But that poor school had rich teachers. And one of them was Principal Bhave. Mm-hmm. Principal Bhave believed in not chalk and talk, but she experienced and learn, so as to say. So, for example, one day he took us, uh, took us out uh, into the sun. He had this convex lens in his hand. He wanted to show us how to find the focal length, okay? And then he moved it up and down, and there was the brightest spot. And then he said, this distance is focal length. And they hid it for some time, and the paper burned. Mm-hmm. And when the paper burned, for some reason, he turned to me, and he says, like this, if you focus, you can achieve anything in the world. That did two things for me. That was a wow moment for me. The first, yeah. I said, science is so powerful, I'm going to be a scientist. The second was, focus, and you can achieve um, anything. Later on, I saw more meaning in it. You know, what is that? Uh, if you look at a convex lens, the sun's rays are all parallel. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what is the property of parallel lens? They don't meet. Mm-hmm. Okay. What does the convex lens do? It brings them together. So as to say. So I coined the term convex lens leadership. So when I went to National Chemical Laboratory, there were divisions in organic chemistry division, organic chemistry division, chemistry division, 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 division. I said, no. One in When mm-hmm. I went to CSR, I did that. When I became the president of Global Research Alliance, by the way, mm-hmm. 60,000 scientists from around the world, uh, like, uh, for example, Fraunhofer Geiser of Germany, VTT Finland, VTI Denmark, you know, Netherlands, Battel US, etc., etc. Mm-hmm. Once again, we brought that big uh, purpose in, and they were all parallel because nothing in common, and sort of uh, we uh, brought them through. So that convex leadership is what the world needs. Yeah, yeah. fabulous. Today, what has happened, the race, religion, the kind of conflicts that we have are keeping us parallel. Conversely, we should visit together. I'm afraid in many ways we get into concave institutions. What does concave institutions do? The parallel lines, they go even further apart. Yeah. What mm-hmm. the world as a whole needs is really uh, getting that convex institution. Like uh, in Sanskrit, we say Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Word as one family, as you know, uh, mm-hmm. we can divert into another subject. I don't want to do that because you are talking about innovation. Uh, but this extreme nationalism versus a global village uh, mm-hmm. concept, etc. So these were certain things I learned. I, I consider myself very fortunate mm-hmm. that as a poor boy, I could go to a rich school and learn this. Mm-hmm. I think it's a fantastic story. It's also to do with how you're interpreting things. Um, I think we uh, one sees a lot of things around them and stimuli is everywhere, how you're able to have the mindfulness to then take that and then process it and turn it into a narrative to then absorb it and say, actually, in my life, if I forget everything, I'm going to remember the story that, you know, about about the, the convex lens. 
Can I ask you one question? Because you work with some of the biggest companies in the world, in India in particular, Reliance, and I'm sure the Ambani family, I know counts on you, you're an advisor to the leaders there. And of course, you have the Tata Group. And I've, I've noticed, you know, you've been in various presentations with Ratan Tata. You are close to him. I'm sure he sees you as a um, an advisor too. We are in admiration of these folks. That's fine. What does the next generation look like, in your opinion, in terms of the enterprise leadership uh, values? Yes, I, I would say, uh, <clears throat> I'm very close to them. Yes, you are absolutely right. Uh, in fact, uh, Mukesh Ambani, uh, I have not met a leader like him, by the way. He's absolutely incredible, mind-boggling. Mind, mind mm -hmm. But uh, this has gone on from Dhirubhai Ambani's time, you know. I mean, if you look at, and from generation to generation, it is moving, um, right. basically. So, so Dhirubhai Ambani, then Mukesh Ambani, and then his three children, uh, Akash, Isha, and uh, Anand. He said, so if we go back, as a matter of fact, talking about scarcity and aspiration, uh, and that is where Dhirubhai Ambani started his journey. Mm -hmm. Like petrol pump attendant in Eden, coming back, starting selling saris, then Vimal, then uh, uh, how does it, uh, 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 it is made of polyester, and suddenly it was considered a rich man's fiber. He said, no, I will make it poor man's fiber. Mm. Then went into uh, manufacture of polyester, then petrochemicals, then refining, and so on and so forth. Mm. And uh, something which was just a $12 million uh, sort of company, uh, just uh, uh, in uh, uh, 2007, today is uh, a $215 billion company. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. I call it always, call them as a kind of a uh, inspirational exponential. I think uh, exponential is the only way to see. And okay, for example. So yeah. just Urvay Ambani said, uh, you know, phone call at the cost of a postcard. So when we talk about aspiration, it is not an aspiration for yourself. It is for the society, for mm -hmm. the nation. Like I said, the, the, the you know, uh, our, uh, sort of it used to take us six uh, 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 day, uh, years to get a telephone, basically. And mm -hmm. it used to be mm -hmm. so expensive. And he said, phone call at the cost of postcard. And what did uh, uh, Mukesh do? Mukesh did something completely different mm. in terms of making the phone call free, the voice call free, mm -hmm. and for per GB as data and half a billion dollar customers. And mm. that is where, the, uh, if you ask me the, the, about the leadership, uh, that is described in this uh, particular book, Leap yes. for Walty, you know, which I co authored with. Uh, in fact, it came up because of my. Uh, talk with the uh, 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 sort of uh, uh, Mukesh, uh, and I want to explain that because that also explains the uh, quality of your leadership. So we had this, you are right, actually, I chaired the Reliance Innovation Council, which had Nobel laureates like John Mary Lane, Nobel laureates uh, uh, like uh, Bob Grubbs, and um, you know, C.K. Prahlad was a sort of mm -hmm. member of that, and George Weisside, the highest cited scientist in the world, but market cap of $30 billion, mm -hmm. you know, incredible sort of uh, council. And we used to discuss about uh, the way forward. And one day I remember uh, Mukesh mentioning to me that, uh, Doc, we must leapfrog and do this. And I said, let's uh, get into the fundamental. Why does the frog leap? He leaps because he's afraid of the predator and jumps a few feet. All right. We must pole vault. The size of the pole is the size of your aspiration. Mm -hmm. Right. We loved it and we created a program called Beyonders. So out of hundreds of, 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 of a few hundred thousand, we would pick up 25, 30 young people who were thinking, uh, I mean, capable of uh, 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 creating that uh, aspiration and pole vaulting uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, to the sort of next way. And that culture, basically, that is uh, 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 defined as a reliance culture, has permeated uh, through the generations. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say if you just see not only the diversity and complexity of the business, but the speed, scale and sustainability of what they do mm -hmm. is incredible. It's what is called as a sort of real speed. I mean, <laughs> when you talk about Geo, for example, yeah, you know, the onboarding uh, of 50 million customers, uh, if you uh, go back, uh, you know, it used to take several years to onboard 50 million customers. 
and the record was held by Twitter two years. Right. Okay, they did it in 83 days. So that is the speed, the mm. scale, half a billion mm. sort of customers and sustainability. But most importantly, the big purpose. Now, for example, I'm the chairman of their new energy council. Okay, so big, these big dreams about green hydrogen. Right. All right. Because as you know, there is a gray hydrogen, blue hydrogen, and green hydrogen. Right. Green hydrogen uses electricity to split water, which is also uh, uh, sort of uh, green. Or uh, uh, it comes from uh, uh, solar uh, photovoltaic uh, devices. Uh, you generate mm -hmm. electricity, so mm -hmm. it is really green. And then you use it to split water. The rest of the world is hovering around four to five dollar per kg of green hydrogen at the moment. You know what are the targets they have said? One, one, one. One kilogram of green hydrogen for one dollar within one decade. And I'm sure the way things are moving, he will move faster. So, mm -hmm. really, uh, so, so, so this is the pole vault. Mm -hmm. pole vault. And pole vault for a big purpose, as a matter of fact. Yeah. yeah. In the term that is going on, it is called geofication of new energy. Just like in geo, he gave to half a billion uh, customers affordable excellence. Mm. Very, very affordable, but mm. highest quality, 4G, LTE, and now he's moving into 5G. That's what he wants to do for, for energy. So for me, it has been absolutely sort of a fascinating experience. And same thing with uh, Radhan Tata. Amazing uh, sort of mind, you know, in terms of philanthropy. In fact, I would be speaking to you if uh, it was not for Sir Dorab Tata's uh, trust scholarship. And the interesting part, I tell you, the interesting yeah. part is that <laughs> Ratan and I share a number of things, but uh, there are three things that I'm particularly proud of. But for Tata Scholarship, I wouldn't be talking to you. That's right. for sure, because I would have uh, dropped out of school. Uh, there is this award called Padma Bhushan, which is the uh, second highest uh, award in uh, uh, India, and the President of India gives it. And that was given on 17 March 2000, and he got it, and I got it. Okay, and got it from uh, our former president, K.R. Narayanan, who was himself a Tata scholar. Both right. of us were able to study. Can you just imagine? Similarly, he, he got this National Leadership Award. He got it in industry. I got it uh, in science and technology and elaborate work in the social. And also, the American mm -hmm. Academy of Arts and Science, you know, he, he was the sixth, I was the seventh, and we are signed on the same page. There are only seven, by the way, after 1780. Wow, okay. So, yeah, yeah. So, I... I, I, I <coughs> <clears throat> very rightly said, I enjoyed enormous uh, sort of uh, uh, rapport and learned a lot, benefited mm. a lot from these two great uh, uh, sort of uh, houses, if I may. Yeah. yeah, that's magnificent. I mean, I think, you know, and it's wonderful for you, for you to share this and for us to hear this because it creates the, um, the hope. It creates a sense of energy and also inspiration for us to then think about how we can build on this moving forward. Of course, these leaders have taken us to this point and they're pole vaulting. I like that a lot. Um, and by the way, just going back, you have a number of books that you have written for the audience out there because I'm sure they'll be interested in you. Uh, just before we close off, I just want you to let everyone know. Um, we'll talk more, of course, but you have a website. You have numerous books that are available on that website, your articles, everything's available there. So what, what is that website, Dr. Mashelkar? It is very simple. It is <coughs> www.mashelkar.com. That's all. Got it. So www.mashelkar.com. Yeah, mashelkar.com. That's it. Yeah. yeah, or you could do what I did. I I typed in um, Dr. Michelle's name and went onto Wikipedia. So you could do that too, and you have a a a, a long a long list of um, uh, accolades and so on and so forth. So let's shift gears now. I'd like to now spend some time talking about um, the Anjani. Um, Michelle Foundation. So we've talked about inclusive innovation. I think we've absolutely touched on the importance of uh, access equality versus income equality. I think it's it's the undertone of what you're saying. It's underscored by a lot of things you've already said. Um, we've touched on scarcity, aspiration. So we get when you have scarcity and aspiration, if joined together, it's a powerful combination, the, the, the feeding ground for dangerous optimism, and it can create a pole vaulting mindset. So we absolutely have touched on that. Now let's look at some of the good work that uh, you were doing and some stories of inclusive innovation that you have personally endorsed and supported and funded. So talk us through what the Anjani Mashelka Foundation is about, why why are you doing it and where is it going? 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is the 11th year of the foundation, by the way. If, uh, and the way it got formed is also very interesting because, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I was in Delhi as a director general of CSIR and my mother was in Pune. Uh, it's a distance of around 1200 kilometers. But every Friday evening, I used to come uh, and be in my lab. Uh, Saturday, Sunday, I'll be in the lab and Sunday, I will go back. And my practice was each time, what I'll put my hand in my pocket and whatever money was there, I'll give it to her. I never asked her what she did with it. When she passed away, 17 November 2006, my daughter Shruti was adjusting her saris, you know, reorganizing her saris. And she found all that money back there with a little note that uh, you're a scientist, don't forget our roots. Use this for doing some science of bringing, I don't remember the exact word, benefit to the poor. That mm. is where the idea of Anjani Mashalka Inclusive Innovation Award came. So, inclusive innovation uh, is actually getting all the excluded uh, inside. Because as you know, our greatest challenge today, very frankly, yeah. the world is facing is <clears throat> And after pandemic, as you know, the inequalities have just exponentially grown. In fact, uh, World Bank report says that 100 million people who are poor have gone to extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. Their income levels are less than one point, uh, sort of nine dollar uh, $9 per day, and so on. So, if they have uh, such income inequality, how can you create access equality? That looks impossible. Right. But that is what is uh, possible to be done. And when I talk about inequalities, by the way, it's not uh, just disparity in income. It is disability. It is dis uh, distance. It is discrimination, something that is created by humans, mm. basically, from our mm. society. That mm. is why they are excluded. So how do you include all those excluded? You know, the people, when you drive on the street, you see them sleeping on the, uh, the thing, or the refugees uh, that came in to Germany and all. And uh, inequality is not a problem of India, by the way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. As a matter of fact. I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> no, it is, it is a problem of the whole world, as, as, as a matter of fact. And um, uh, it has got exaggerated during uh, uh, sort of the pandemic. So this is where the foundation was created. And the idea was, I'm not a great believer in best practice, by the way. Because mm. best practice is something that you copy from others. I'm the believer in next practice. Next practice. Uh, is what others should follow as a be best practice, so as to say. Okay, so there is no incrementalism, there is no copying, there is no reverse engineering, so as to say. It is all forward engineering. And also it was include. So I'll just give you samples of some. One sample yeah. I will show you. Uh, uh, ECG, for example. Normally when you have ECG, you go to lie down and then there are 12 leads that are put up and then the nurse uh, takes a printout, takes half an hour and charges you X amount of money. Uh, one of the first awards that went was to portable ECG. Now you can't believe it. This is the portable ECG that I have in hand, and this is available at Sanket Life. Mm -hmm. uh, what it does, this was created by Rahul Rastogi, who is uh, an electronics uh, wizard. So you have these two sensors here. Uh, you put your fingers for 15 seconds. Then your center, uh, 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 you know, sensor here. This is your heart. Mm -hmm. 15, 15, 15 seconds, you know, 15, 15, 15 seconds. And if you have downloaded an app for Sanket, it goes to you. The, right. uh, to, to any mobile, it can go to your mobile, it can go to the best, uh, you know, heart specialist uh, mobile and so on and so forth. Cost is just 5 rupees. Remember, uh, 75 rupees is a dollar per, per, per ECG. And this cost is nothing. I mean, you can go to uh, Amazon and uh, sort of uh, buy it. It is uh, just... Uh, uh, 4,000 rupees, which is $50. That's all. Mm -hmm. One divided. Now, you can see the uh, clear advantage in a rural setting, for example. If uh, a poor woman gets uh, sort of a pain in the heart and she has to be taken to ECG, she'll be put in a bullock cart or a, <laughs> a jeep or whatever. No need. I mean, this is as simple as that, provided you have a sort of connectivity. Mm. Other one is Vihit Shah, for example, breast cancer. Okay. Now, he has created uh, a, a device uh, which is called Ibris, and for one dollar it does the scan. It has got US FDA certificate, it has got Europe certificate, 
and uh, 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 the uh, partnership that he has built now it is going to some 25 uh, uh, countries and uh, uh, it is completely sort of non uh, uh, invasive uh, you look at uh, for example miskin uh, ingawale mm-hmm. you know found that when he went to villages he found that women were dying of anemia why because they did not know their hemoglobin levels were low why because they wouldn't give their blood they thought it was precious so he created something fine you don't give me your blood and he created something called touch hb which you put around your finger and you know what your hemoglobin is you can see what difference it can basically wow. uh, uh, make right. similarly uh, 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 mothers in villages for example their health doesn't get monitored at all and this uh, sentin murugappan for example created what is called a save mom Uh, which is actually iot based uh, uh, where you know i mean uh, uh, you wear it as a kind of a jewel like a bangle you deliberately had to design it so that men will not use it only women will use it mm-hmm. and it has uh, these sensors from which you can uh, uh, have a measurement of six critical parameters of yours uh, a measurement of sleep uh, the stage then uh, alarm for medicines and so on and so forth and just thousand rupees per thousand days one rupee per day for that mother and mm-hmm. it has been transformed it has gone to more than 100 villages at the moment mm-hmm. and you see uh, the kind of difference it has been uh, uh, sort of uh, 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 able to uh, make you know and i can give examples after examples mm-hmm. the critical part of these is that they are extremely affordable but they also bring in excellence by bringing highest level of technology like for example uh when i mentioned to you about mishkin right that voice that you talk yes. about yes uses photoplethysmography uh photon scattering uh, measurement and also uh, spectroscopy highest level of technologies so uh, the issue is making high technology work for the rich is very easy making low technology work for the poor is very easy making high technology work for the poor is very difficult so mm. all Uh, anjani master ke inclusive innovation awards are that and the final one i will tell you final one says uh, uh, you will find all the details on the website uh, which is very particularly close to my heart you know manual scavengers in india every three four days somebody dies because mm. they go into the manhole and mm. they say the very word manhole is terrible why yes. manhole in the hole machine should be in the hole mm. and they created a robot which goes and does all the a sort of job but then you would say oh come on then you are depriving that manual scavenger of a job what they did was they would train the manual scavenger to do the robot operation yeah now this is access to dignity why mm-hmm. access to dignity because of the child of that manual scavenger was going to school and they asked mm-hmm. him what does your father do they would put their head down and say manual scavenging now mm-hmm. they will say it's a robot operator mm-hmm. and it's making a big difference because now Uh, the government of india is changing uh, sort of uh, uh, the manual scavenging sort of rules and so on and so forth and machines are going to be actually used with training these people yes, so fantastic. i think science must solve technology must transform and innovation must impact all these awards that we have talked about the science is solving technology is transforming and innovation is impacting that's what i feel very proud about brilliant beautiful i mean i um So thrilled to hear everything that you've just shared, and I'm sure our audience will be as well. Um, time, time is um, is is moving forward, and I could speak to you for hours, which we will when I meet you face to face, no doubt. But before we close off, a few more things. Um, you know, you have this abundance of richness experience. I'm sure you've succeeded and you've failed. Uh, you've you know you cannot just have a pathway um, that is filled with success. You've had failures. You've made mistakes. You've learned from them. It's shaped you. You're now now to some extent what I would refer to as the as a wisdom keeper. Um, and you have a lot of wisdom. You have it in your vault, and you are freely sharing all of your wealth with all of us. And that is a a wonderful thing that you're doing because it's making a material difference to us as people. and we would all hopefully do the same as we as we get to that stage of our lives as such 
um, what would you say to people out there? And I'm not going to talk about the next generation. I think all generations are important, let's be honest. <laughs> so, you know, let me not just talk about the next generation. I do care about the future, but I think I'm here now. I'm one generation. You're a generation. The generations that are younger than us, all of the um, alphabets, you know, X, Y, Z, will have all the gens covered. <laughs> what would you say to us right now? And uh, what should we take away from this conversation? Is there a, is a message? Is there a, uh, a story? Is there something you'd like to leave with us so we can think about this when we finish off, um, we finish off this this um, podcast? Thank you. I, as I said, <clears throat> from the book of my own life, and you are absolutely right. I have succeeded. Yeah. I have failed, and uh, well, so on. So I, uh, that distilled wisdom come in what are about. Uh, I like to call as five martial arts mantras, if you like. What okay. I have learned. Okay. So I will quickly narrate them to you. Please. And the very first is aspirations are your possibilities, so keep them high. I think we have talked enough about it, so as to say. The second is the purpose, perseverance, and passion. They matter. There has to be a big purpose. There has to be a north star, not just for yourself, but for your society, for your nation, for the mm -hmm. whole world. As a matter of fact, perseverance is very important. It is too early to quit. Quitters are never winners. Winners are never quitters. And you must do it with passion. That's the second part. The third part, I say, you know, uh, is about hard work. What I learned in my life is uh, there's no substitute to hard work, particularly for young generation. I want to mention that like instant coffee, there is no instant success. It's a toil sort of all around. And what looks like an overnight success has years of toil that goes behind it. I'm, uh, I just turned 79 on 1st January, but I can tell you, I work 24 into 7, day after day, month after month, year after year, and will continue to do so till I breathe my last. The only thing I will uh, say to the young people is work hard uh, in silence. Let success make all the noise. I think that would be uh, the way to do it. Uh, the fourth lesson is... Uh, that you keep on knocking on the doors of opportunities and they don't open, then you get frustrated. I would say you create your own door. Now you say, come on, it, it, it doesn't look possible. So I'll just give you a book, uh, I mean, example from my own book of life. I remember when I came back and joined National Chemical Board in 1976, as you know, India was a very poor country. Yeah. We did a foreign exchange. And therefore, I was trained on rheology and non Newtonian fluid mechanics. And in order to do that, I required some basic equipment, one vaginal reorganometer. Can you believe it? Uh, there was a DGT clearance, not manufactured in India, certificate, and so on and so forth, because every dollar was precious. Mm -hmm. And it would take me two years. So that door was not opening. Right. I said, what is the equipment God has given me? This. And I went into modeling and simulation. 1977, I started the work. And in 1982, one of India's highest prize that is reserved for less than 45 year old scientists called Bhatnagar Prize, I got it for that work. Had I been waiting for that door of opportunity to uh, <laughs> open, it would not have happened. So create your own doors. That's the point I'm trying to make. And the fifth point is I strongly believe that there is no limit to human endurance, no limit to human achievement. Uh, Accepting the limits that you put on yourself. And uh, let me tell a story to you. I mean, uh, Bharat Ratna, which is the highest uh, civilian award, Professor C.N.R. Rao, uh, you know, accepting Nobel Prize as well. He's the most celebrated scientist. He's my guru. And he taught me this particular lesson. So I remember when I became FRS, Fellow of Royal Society, I called him because there are, as, as I said, there are three engineering scientists, that's all, two of us uh, living in 360 years. At that time, of course, it was. Uh, three forty years. Uh, I called him and uh, told him that. And you know what was his response? Not bad. <laughs> I became American Academy of Arts and Science. You know, I was only the seventh and so on. So I called him. Not bad. Then I became U.S. National Academy of Inventors. Uh, you know, I was the first Indian to be sort of honored. And I called him. At, at least now he would say. Again, he said not bad. Then I said, Sir, what do I have to do to uh, sort of uh, impress you. What he told me is my last message, because that I have carried through for life. What he said is that, Mr. you are climbing on a ladder of excellence, which is limitless. 
The only limit is what you put on your head. Mm-hmm. Turning it around, off, what it means is that no matter what you achieve, you have to say, "My best is yet to come." Yeah. So why don't we do this? That every day in the morning when we get up, you say, "My best is yet to come," and maybe today will be the day. So whether you are eighteen or eighty-eight, it doesn't matter. My best is yet to come. Not just for me. For what I'm doing to the society, for the nation, to the world, for uh, sort of a, a global good, and if that happens, I think we'll most certainly have smile on the face of billions of people around the world. These are the five lessons from my life. I would say, brilliant, brilliant, absolutely amazing, and five lessons that um, I will imprint in my mind for sure, because each one of them is central to how we live a better life as well. Not just about business and aspirations, but it's also about、um, balance and equilibrium, personally and professionally. So, thank you so much for doing that. I will keep you for another five minutes, if that's okay. And、um, because these questions did come, that I'm going to share with you right now, there are a couple of questions, and if you could rapid fire try and answer them, that would be amazing.、Um, the first question really is from the West,、uh, from a Western government now looking to approach India. Let's call it the new India, the term I used. But now looking to approach India, encouraging Indians to come and set up businesses in their land, to launch,、uh, you know, companies, to do sharing of IP and so on. What would you say to the Western governments who are trying to do that with India right now in terms of their approach?、Uh, I, pr- I, I guess the approach they were using ten years ago is not going to be suitable and relevant.、Uh, yet many of the Western governments are still using. The best practices from yesterday, no next practices. What guidance would you give these government leaders as to how they should engage the new demographic? One of the three Ds that you talked about. Yes, absolutely.、Uh, I, I think,、uh, as I said,、uh, India's great strength lies in its uh, uh, demography, but more importantly, in terms of its talent. And the future wars are going to be fought on talent, very frankly.、Yeah. Yes. I think the way the world of technology is going to、uh, sort of、uh, evolve, and thanks to the emergence of the digital world,、uh, you know there are newer ways of doing things that have emerged.、Mm-hmm. You know,、uh, the, the very idea of immigration, for example,、uh, is changing. I mean, you can be anywhere in the world, and、um, sort of、uh, you can do things. And therefore, I think we have to create in this hyper-connected world. Uh, understanding the new reality, new models of、uh, engagement and business creation. That's all that I would、uh, say because、uh, the legacy of the past,、uh, you know, where、uh, with extreme nationalism we are、uh, sort of missing out、uh, right. on the benefits of、uh, being sort of one global family. Yes,、uh, that that has to、uh, sort of give way. So there has to be, as they say,、uh, parachute works only when it is open. Mind is also like that. It only works when it is open.、Mm-hmm. I think that openness、uh, in terms of、uh, thinking and creating new models is what is required.、Mm, fantastic, lovely, and that open mind. The analogy of the parachute is very important for the the Western governments now. Very interested in India. Very, very interested in India for a variety of different reasons. So that's a good takeaway.、Uh, another question was really, a really, I think you've kind of answered that. But what would you,、uh, if you had your younger self here, whatever age, you know, in your thirties or your twenties or even younger, and the younger self is right here, right in front of you, and you have two minutes with the younger self, what would you say to the younger self?、Uh, well,、uh, I would simply say. That the potential in each one of us, you know, is incredibly high. It is all about realizing the potential,、mm-hmm. and then when you realize the potential, exceeding that potential, you know, so that trust in yourself, basically, that yes, you can. I know you wanted a brief answer, but I will give you slightly longer answer、Please. than you can sort of put it.、Uh, Uh, in the way that we want. One of the inspirational stories is the following:、uh, Bill Gates basically、uh, had come to India, and I remember I had、uh, the privilege of having a dinner come discussion with him, along with some of the other thought leaders from India. And he told us about a story, which is uh, 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 is about、uh, his giving the Harvard University's 
a commencement lecture mm-hmm. he said that i declared myself as the most successful dropout from harvard and of course he was and then he narrated a story that while he was young there was uh, this uh, 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 company uh, and those were early days of hardware manufacturing computers by the way and there was a company in albuka and he must have been what uh, 18 19 20 year old or whatever and he called that company and he said you are uh, 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 manufacturing hardware you will require software i will give it to you and he said also with a mischievous smile that uh, i thought they will keep the phone down 18 year old early days of computers saying i will give you this you know what they told him they told him we are not ready as yet come after a month and what we get told them was thank god they said come after a month because i did not have the software that i was offering <laughs> i know I, i i get that yeah that that is the confidence so i think each one of you you know should have that self confidence that yes i can and then yes i will Mm, beautiful that's a, a wonderful uh, music to my ears uh, and then the final question was and i'll leave you with this question is um related to the future the future of the world and the future of india in, in that regard so given everything we've talked about today and where we have been where we've got to where we're now and where we're going to go what is your uh, what is your foresight and your wisdom tell you i'm not going to call it a prediction because it's not but where do you think the world is headed you can give us two scenarios if you wish or more a really happy joyful one and one that is more sinister and uh filled with a little bit of darkness if if you wish or any other way you would like to answer that question yes i think uh, there are different scenarios that one can build yeah uh, uh, there is no doubt about that and particularly uh, after the uh, pandemic uh pandemic has been to my mind the trailer for climate change what can happen if climate change happens you know in terms of supply side challenges demand side challenges and global amplification we have demonstrated it so one scenario is that we don't learn our lessons basically and climate change causes the kind of disasters that uh, uh, sort of are predicted or that we have seen pandemic accepting that they will be much more sort of expanded that is the bleak scenario the other good scenario is that better sense prevails so as to say all right and here for dealing with climate change it's not a single nation which is going to be responsible we all come together and we say that the future of our grandchildren and their great grandchildren matters the future of humanity matters and we all work together and we created uh, let's say our green future uh, by doing really the vasudeva kutumbakam that is coming together as a family i would say uh, these are the two families because if you ask me after inequalities what is uppermost in my mind it is this mm. the climate change got it wonderful and so with that in mind uh, dr michelle kar it's been an absolute joy and pleasure to have this conversation with you of course we could go on and on and on no doubt and um when i do visit india or if you visit the uk at any point it would be fantastic to have you as a guest and spend more time over a cup of tea or coffee or um um some food to sit down and talk about where we are and where we need to go thank you so much for your time thank you for giving us this amazing first show for straight talk in 2022 Let's hope our future is as bright as it um as it should be and we will take all of the lessons that you've shared today seriously and apply them to um our journeys our, our individual journeys and our business and um governmental journeys. So thank you very much I form my hands and and um, with immense gratitude look after yourself and we'll absolutely be in touch and uh, take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.